Welcome back, John Valvano here. Uh, today we're going to talk about something that I don't want to—I don't want to say, and you don't want to hear—but uh, it's very important for us as embedded system engineers, and that is uh, software style requirements, paperwork, uh, rules and regulations, restrictions, all the bad things, all the things that take the the joy out of what we do. However, uh, when you get older and you're the boss, uh, you're going to love this lecture. But today, I promise uh, you and I will find it both very painful for me to give and for you to listen to. So we're going to talk about software style. We're going to talk about ways in which we uh, measure ourselves. And most importantly, uh, we're going to end up in the requirements document, which is our way, our legal way to tell when we're done. All right, if you want to read more about this, you'll see that there's uh, lots of written about it in the book. All right, so uh, let's let's. Let's begin with a software style. Now, in this class, uh, you don't have to follow, follow the Valvano style, uh, but you, you have to have one. Okay? And so, illustrated here in the book and all the starter code will be a very uh, specific style uh, that I have embraced. And your job as young engineers is to find your own style, to figure out where it is you want things to be. And when you become boss, uh, then you'll make the other people in your group uh, conform to your style. All right. So if you watch me, I spend a lot of thought on names. And names allow you to understand what a function does, what a variable does. And so names should have meaning. They should be unambiguous. Uh, you should not have variables uh, that don't clearly, names and functions that don't clearly say what they do. Um, now, there are some people who tell you the type of the variable in the variable name itself. And so if it's an unsigned variable, they'll use a U in the name. If it's 32 bits, the number 32 will be in the name. Now, I don't happen to do that, but I think it's good style. And so uh, anytime you can help the reader understand not only what that variable is, what does it mean, how does it work, uh, for both variables and functions, uh, a lot of that's tied up in the name we give it. Okay? Um, and you got to be consistent. That's what it means to have a rules. That's what regulations are. This is what thou shalt do every time one programs. Okay? And, and me, I love my spaces in a certain spot. I don't like my tabs. Uh, I take all the tabs out because when I go from one computer to the other and I got tabs, it always looks ugly. Okay? So I can type two spaces the same time it takes you to type one tab. And so in that way, uh, my code is easy to go from one to another. And so I'll use the same process. In other words, if you see the letters PT in my, that's a pointer. Okay? Um, if you see the name uh, CNT, that's a counter. Okay? Uh, I and J are indices. Those are, those are the, so we're going to use the same types of names for the same types of objects. Okay. And you will see that uh, I will, one of the things I do is I let you know what type of variable it is. Is it private? Is it public? Is it local? Is it global? All those sort of things are tied up in the name, and we'll see that in the next sequence. And I'm going to use upper and lower case to help you understand more about that variable. Okay. And I use, a, um, I use a process called camel, uh, camel humping, to, to to eliminate uh, various words that I want to put together. Okay. And so it's easy for you to understand a variable when it's defined, where it exists, a function, when you write it. The actual code for that function is obvious. Uh, but a really good style allows you to extract what that means or what that does away from where it's defined. Okay? And so this clarity, making it easy to understand, is a hallmark of good software style. And so uh, let's, let's look at some examples. Okay, so these are some of my, this is according to the rules of Alvano, which again, you don't have to follow, but you have to have one. Uh, if you use all capital letters, that's a constant. It's not a variable, it's a constant. So the port is actually an address constant, and so it's got all capital letters. If you want to concatenate various words together, uh, since it's all capitals, I'm going to, there's, I'm going to use the underline. Okay. Uh, and that underline is different than this underline, uh, which we'll use for public variables and public functions. Okay. Uh, if you look at the first letter, 
um, the first letter of my variables tells me whether it's private in scope or public in scope. Okay, so if it's private, it'll have a lowercase first variable. First, the first letter of the variable will be lowercase. And if it's an uppercase, that means it's public. So I can tell uh, variables that are shared versus variables that are specific, locally scoped to that function. Okay. And now let's talk about functions. Uh, now we probably shouldn't have any global public variables. Uh, that's actually very bad style. But if we were to have some, uh, they would have the name of the module in it. So let's talk about functions. Functions uh, that are public, that are shareable, that exist as uh, prototypes in the header file, are going to have one underline, or at least one underline in it. And prior to that underline, it's going to tell me what module it's in. So the key in care function is going to have a prototype in the key.h. And it's going to have an implementation in key.c. Okay? So I know not only is it public, but I know where to find its prototype, I know where to find its implementation. Okay. Similarly, we will see that, uh, that for the timer, there's going to be a timer.h and a timer.c. And so the underline will let me visually see right by, first off, uh, whether or not a function is private. Is it a helper function, in which case it's got no underlines in it. And it's not callable by anybody but other than those in that file. Or is it public? Okay. And you notice I use camel. This is camel type, uh, where I want to concatenate multiple words together uh, without using the underline. Okay. And you can see uh, in my world, I'm trying to tell you what it is. So last character typed is the last character typed. Okay. Uh, error count is the number of errors you've had. Okay. Max temperature is the largest temperature you've ever seen. Okay? So those are, in my opinion, very good variable names, uh, very good functions, uh, because the name itself tells you what it does. Okay? It clarifies the use. Uh, comments? Uh, actually, you know, the best software has no comments. If you can write software that's perfectly clear and easy to understand just by looking at it, doesn't require copious amounts of explanation of why you did this, and that's probably better software, but nevertheless, uh, we can't quite get there, so we're going to add comments. Now, it's important for you to realize who's going to read the comments. So, if we look at the C file, the C file is our coworker. Those are, that's ourselves six months from now. And so we're going to put into the, into comments in the C file, everything we need to debug it, to change it, to modify it, to understand how it works. Okay, so this is how it works. Um, as opposed to the H file, in the H file, it's used by our clients. The people who are either going to use our software, uh, that, again, that's a, uh, the prototypes of the public functions, or going to buy our software. And this is going to help them, what does it do? How do I use it? Uh, what is the overall, what's the high level understanding? What are the parameters? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What does it do? Okay, and that's in the H file. Okay? And uh, when I uh, include, now there's some people that uh, include a lot of H files. But when I, when I write my code, include timer.h, okay, that, if, I, if I'm in this file right here, that is a call graph link down to the timer function, the timer module. Okay? So the include files are actually linkages in the, in the, in, in the call graph. And so, to make it simple, we want fewer arrows. And to make it simple, we want fewer includes. Um, and so, uh, we want to separate our system out so that there are fewer uh, uh, linkages in the call graph. Okay. So, we only include files that are absolutely necessary. Now, in Valvano world, I don't like my header files to include other header files uh, because now I not, maybe have no idea how it's connected. Uh, and so, there are some people that think that's good style, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm saying they're wrong. Uh, and that is, in Valvano world, only C files include header files. And that way, uh, you can clearly see all of the modules that this particular file needs to operate. 
Okay, and that will help you draw the call graph uh, in your system. Now there are some automatic uh, call graph generators uh, like uh, uh, dioxin here, dioxygen. Doxygen is an automatic parser of the source code uh, that looks at the header files and the C files and the comments and extracts uh, what it does and how it's connected up and where what module is connected to what other module. These are all very good things and come back a year from now I'm going to have one of these embedded in this class but I haven't got there yet. Uh, but these are all very good uh, uh, very good mechanisms to help you automatically document how it is your, your modules are connected together. Um, yeah, let me yell at you. Uh, don't tell me something I already know. Uh, 45 comments is bad. One very well-placed comment is good. Okay, so yeah, use your words. This is not poetry. This is not prose. We're not trying. We're not paid by the character. We're paid if our system is easy to understand. So uh, tell me things I need to know. Tell me how it works. Yeah, that's what I want to know. Tell you made a decision. You use interrupts. You didn't use interrupts. You use DMA. You use I squared C. You use the analog digital converter. Tell me why you made those choices. Because I may have to change it. And if I need to know what you were thinking when you made that decision, why'd you use port B? Yeah, maybe you didn't care. Maybe you did care. Uh, I want to know why you made your decisions. This will help me understand your thinking when you wrote this code. And more importantly, help me change and use your code the next time I want to run. Okay? Uh, tell me how to test it because it doesn't work unless it's tested. All right? and, and don't litter your software with stupid stuff. I mean, I don't need you to tell me that N++ is adding one to N. Okay? So I don't need you to tell me that this line makes x equal to zero. Tell me why you want x equal to zero. Tell me what it means. Tell me when you did it. What it what's it what's the significance of making x equal to zero? Don't tell me x is equal to zero. I, I can see that. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about the requirements document. Okay. And so this is a modifiable, this is a fluid, this is a high level, uh, this is a contract between you and your vendor, whether it be the customer you're writing the software for or the buyer of the machine they're going to buy. This is the high level, uh, what does it have to do? And for an example, rather than go over this in, um, in theory, let me open up the requirements document for lab three and we'll, we'll go through that. All right. Okay, uh, let's look at the requirements document for lab three, which is an alarm clock. Okay, uh, the first part of the first section is sort of a very high level. Okay, uh, why are we doing this project? Okay, what's the point of doing this project? Why are we here? Okay, we're, well, we're making an alarm clock. Okay, and I want you to learn how to use interrupts, and I want you to learn how to test, and I want you to learn how to use a BJT. That's why I'm making this assignment. Uh, but uh, why are we here? The second is uh, sort of an overview of the process. Well, how will it happen? Well, there's going to be two of you. You got a lab partner. Uh, you're going to uh, use the TM4C123. You're going to uh, connect some switches and a, you know, either a keypad or a bunch of switches, the LCD, uh, the keyboard, etc. So, um, how will it be developed? You'll do it on a solderless breadboard and wire it up, and you'll show it to the TA. That's the overall. Uh, who does what? Well, you got two lab partners and a TA who's going to check it off. What is everybody's responsibility? What are the, uh, uh, who are your clients? Okay, that's an important thing to know before you get started. Okay? Who are your clients? How will it fit in to other things? And as I said, we're going to use the TM4C123 board. We're going to use the, we're going to use the same graphics module that we had in, in lab two. Um, we're going to use the same solderless breadboard. We're going to power it with USB cables. Sort of uh, uh, interactions with the existing system. Uh, now nobody's going to die if you uh, if you mess up. Okay, um, but uh, who's going to own it when we're done? Okay, who's going to own it when we're done? What's the uh, what's the intellectual property of this alarm clock? Now you're going to use a lot of starter code in this. Um, in this uh, class, uh, the TivaWare that you could use or the Valvanoware, these are all open stuff. You're allowed to use it. You don't have to pay me any money. Um, 
And so, uh, on the other hand, in this particular class, we don't want you cheating, so your, your lab three cannot be transmitted to any other buddy's lab three, either in the past or the present or the future. So that's how we're gonna manage intellectual property in this particular class. Um, we might be interested in some special terms that you never saw before. Uh, we've talked about latency, time jitter, uh, critical sections. We talked about the power, well, we're gonna talk about the power budget. Um, these are all lab three terms that you have to either know what they mean uh, because not the, the whole world doesn't necessarily ascribe to our, our specific definitions. So we're gonna define them in the requirements document so everybody's on the same page. And now it gets a little more detailed. Uh, what does the clock have to do? You've got to have hours and minutes. Uh, but you notice it doesn't say seconds. Okay, see that? It doesn't say seconds. It's going to show you both in picture form or, and in number form. See, those are requirements for your lab. Okay? Um, we're going to have to have an alarm that the operator can set and turn on and off. It's got to make some sound. That was the BJT thing we did last time. Put out a square wave. It makes a buzz. Um, and then we've got to shut it off. And then uh, lastly, uh, in this class, as in all of our labs, we have to have a process for debugging. So we'll use heartbeats, we'll use dumps, uh, whenever it is uh, uh, appropriate for that lab. So you need a process for debugging. Okay. Uh, what are the phases? Now, this is all, every of the labs in this class are usually one week, so we have the prep, we have the demo, we have the report, those are essentially our phases. Uh, but a bigger system might have more phases and more interesting phases. Uh, we're going to have a prototype. No, we're going to have one system. It's a clock. It's due in a week. Uh, build it. Show it to your TA. Uh, and it has a uh, solderless breadboard. But a system might have prototypes and second prototypes and third prototypes and demos and, and deliverables and manufacturing. And so there may be more uh, devices, more stages uh, in a typical system. Uh, how are we going to judge how well it works? We need to define what it is is good and then develop methods to show you that it's good. Okay, so uh, we got to remove all the critical sections. That's bad. Uh, critical sections are bad. You got to prove me you don't have any. Okay, um, you have to make sure it's beautiful. Okay, and beautiful is in the eye of the teaching assistant or in general your customer. But uh, and it has to tell time. Okay, so we got to have it tell time. Um, we got to write good code. And in this class, we don't have any backward jumps in the interrupt service routine. That's bad. Uh, we're going to drive it off the 5 volt power of the device. Okay? So how much power it takes to run is a performance measure. So we'll, we'll measure the average current, the average 5 volt current that your system takes uh, while running. And if the sound is gone, it's going to take more current, obviously. Uh, how we're going to use it, uh, I don't care how many switches you have, this is variable. If you want three switches, modify it. If you want six switches, modify it. This is a modifiable document. This is between you and your customer. Um, and so if you don't like something, change it. Okay? In this case, I'm expecting four switches. If you want to put in three, change the document, make it three. Okay? Um, and we're going to be able to set the time, turn the alarm off, and set the modes. Okay? All right, so it's going to be a clock. Uh, and as we mentioned last time, don't put this transistor in full saturation because it'll annoy everybody in the building. So there's no real safety a aspect in this cloud, in this cloud, in this lab is don't make too much noise. Okay, so make the alarm soft, quiet, easy. Okay, uh, deliverables uh, report. Uh, all projects have a deliverable. In our in our case, we're going to turn a lab manual. Uh, there's no really particularly any audits, but we do have a prep, and so you got to do the prep, and then we've got the demo, and we got the do, got the project. And what are the outcomes? Obviously, uh, the report and the device are the outcomes. Okay, so that's an overview of the requirements document. Uh, there's a couple of important things. It has to be unambiguous, completely clear, and if it becomes ambiguous, then you change it. It's modifiable. It's negotiable. You and your customer, you and your client don't agree, then you can't solve it. We're going to work at the beginning to make this happen. All right, next, uh, that, was a <coughs> that was the requirements document. Let's talk about performance measures. Uh, does it work? Um, and to me, when I look at software, a good software is easy to understand. Uh, um, 
We want to uh, make sure it actually works. We want to look at the requirements, things it must do. Did I satisfy those requirements? Uh, did I fit within the boundary of my problem? Okay. Uh, my charge to you at the beginning is styles may seem like a like a constricting, arbitrary thing. Uh, and so what I want you to do is practice with it. Try some styles. See if you can find one you like. Because when you're boss, uh, you're going to love this. You're going to love requirements documents. You're going to love performance measures. You're going to love programming style. Because it helps you manage large, complex systems. It lets your coworkers talk to each other. It lets your one coworker to come in and pick up the work of another coworker. Okay? And when you get to be boss, you get to run things the way you want. So now I want you to practice. I want you to practice. Okay? Um, one of the hallmarks of embedded systems is designing within constraints. Okay? So we always have constraints. It must fit inside this box. It must cost less than $10. It must be less than this many grams. It must use uh, this much power. Okay. And so some of the other parameters that are specific are it has to work this fast. How many bytes per second does it transmit? How many bytes per second does it calculate? How fast does it respond to an input? Okay. And we saw in the last lab I was interested in time jitter. Okay. If I'm sampling the ADD converter, I'm interested in how much jitter, how much jitter there is in my data. Okay. Um, Again, constraints. Well, if you're going to use the 123, it better use less than 32K of RAM. Okay, if you're going to use the Kyle uh, free compiler, the whole thing better be less than 32K. Um, and your program, again, for this particular processor, has to be less than 256 kibibytes. Okay. Uh, again, we always live in constraints. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter how big your memory is. Uh, if you're a good design fits inside of that inside of that constraint all right um, specification is things it has to do okay it has to have a certain bandwidth latency the accuracy is the difference between measured and and truth the resolution is the smallest change i can distinguish uh, there are two uh, parameters associated with uh, noise and that is if i repeat the same operator the same, if I repeat the same measurement over and over and over again with the same operator, the same conditions, the same day, and the same machine, and look at the standard deviation, if I look at the probability mass function versus outcome, and if I look at this standard deviation, that's what you did in lab two. Uh, this is a measure of noise, and we're going to call this particular one repeatability uh, because it's the, uh, the standard deviation of multiple operations with the same operator. But if I do this same experiment, this same probability mass function, and now I vary, the operator is different, uh, the conditions are different, uh, the temperature went up, the, 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 uh, it's night, it's day, it's Wednesday, it's Thursday, it's Friday. Uh, uh, different machines. Uh, now it's a little bit harder, uh, and we're going to call that reproducibility. And so this is a more important parameter, but much harder to, to meet. Okay. As opposed to constraints uh, of what uh, specification is what it must do, and a constraint is what it must not do, obviously. They're converses, and so there's really no way of separating one versus the other. Uh, but typically, we think of it must use less than this amount of power, or must fit within this box, and weigh less than that uh, as constraints. Uh, we're often given a budget. In you, your case, you got seven days to get the lab done. That's your budget. Um, and uh, as you know, we have to fit into a certain amount of memory. We saw that earlier. All right. And time and money are often related uh, and so we can often trade one for the other but we always live in, in a constraint okay so in summary i want you to have fun with the style uh, develop your own practice enjoy look at the tivaware download and look at tivaware it's a completely different style uh, some say way better than valvanoware but completely different uh, judge for yourself 
Um, uh, you're going to have to write a requirements document. Somebody who uh, somebody said that if you have no requirements doc document, you're never done. So you have no way in which to say uh, when the project's done. So the requirements document, as one of its parameters or as the whole thing, will let you know when the project is finished because you've met all your milestones. Okay? And uh, embedded systems will design will. The design of an embedded system will always fit in some, in some constraints. Okay, next time we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to start talking about wireless because we get up to Lab 4. We're going to hook our microcontroller up to the Internet, send some packets, create an Internet of Thing, and that's what we're going to do next time. See you in class.